Hello everybody, in today's video we are going to go continue our study of music theory. So going forward we have, let's see, we have Mondays are our language study day, in this case it's going to be shorthand, Tuesdays are um, computer programming, Wednesdays mathematics, Thursdays music and music theory. So we're continuing that track and Switching gears here just a little bit in that we're going to be working through the music theory book that has been provided by none other than our gracious U.S. military, U.S. State, uh, United States Navy School of Music. Uh, Act 19, well, this is their seal for 1935, but the book, I believe, was written 1950. So it's in the public domain. You can see I'm kind of cheap. I like, uh, I like the books in the public domain. It's easier for you too. That way, uh, you don't have to buy a book. You can just read through it at your own at your own pace. Uh, just pull off a PDF of it. So today, I'm hoping to get through Chapter One, Sections One through Seven, which is staff, clefs, notes, rests, alterations, time signatures, and the artificial division of notes. So today is just going to be a very rough review over the entire over that entire section hopefully not too many examples um, examples will come in the form of follow-up videos so with that let's go ahead and get into it uh, let's go ahead and skim over the uh, the preface uh, we see here just some some good uh, some good uh, notes to go over I'll let you read that on your own time and here we go introduction this actually will cover a little bit of what we covered, I think it was last week, right? Where I was talking about what is sound, what is music, what separates music from uh, uh, what separates music from just noise. And so here, this is a little bit more of a concrete definition, which is very nice. Sound is produced by vibrations. These vibrations may be regular or irregular and are transmitted by the air from the source that produces them to the human ear. The ear, vibrating in sympathy with the vibrations, sends an impulse to the brain where the sensation of sound is recorded. Now it says the ear vibrating in sympathy with the vibrations. What does that mean? It means that they are linked up, if you will. They are resonating at the same frequency. It says, vibrating in sympathy with the vibrations. Regular vibrations produce a musical sound called tone. Irregular vibrations produce noise. Okay? So, where is it? It says, regular vibrations. Two, pitch. The relative height or depth of musical sound is called pitch. The more rapid the vibrations, the higher the pitch. This, if you remember, we talked about the frequencies, right? So a higher frequency is a higher pitch. A lower frequency is a lower pitch. And that's what the, uh, the rapidity of the vibrations. Number three, intensity. The relative intensity or softness of musical sound is called intensity. The greater the size of the vibration, amplitude, the louder the the sound. So if I so if I'm 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 playing on the piano now, and if I play really softly, that would be the intensity. That would be a low intensity, high intensity, low intensity, and hopefully that's not. Let me go ahead and take a look at that. Yep. So you can kind of hear a difference. There we go. So there's your intensity. Moving on to the next thing, which is timbre or and it's not timber. Yeah, we're not we're not felling a forest here. This is timbre timbre, or quality. The tone quality of a musical sound, i.e. the thing which enables a person to distinguish between the sound from two different instruments, depends upon the way in which the vibration is made. Um, yeah, could be a string, pipe, etc. And upon the relative strength of certain overtones or harmonics. This will be discussed later as the overtone series. So we talked about that a little bit, right? Where you can have, you can have a drone I don't know if the microphone's going to pick this up or not, but uh, e even the uh, the human voice itself produces the overtones, as I discussed in my overtone uh, singing overtone video. And then finally, duration: the length of time a music sound lasts is called duration. So, short duration, long duration, short duration, long duration. 
So that's what's meant by duration. Moving on to chapter one, notation. To indicate musical sounds, to indicate musical sounds and their qualities in writing, we use a group of symbols which we call notation. The symbols which are most frequently used will be discussed under the following general classification, which is staff, clefs, notes, rests, alterations, time signatures, artificial division of notes, key signatures, dynamic indicator indications, tempo indications, musical abbreviations, names of octaves, names of musical instruments and voices, and finally, melodic embellishments. So today, we hope to get through sections 1 through 7. Uh, so essentially, this left-hand column. Let's begin. Number 1, staff. The relative pitch of musical sound is indicated on a series of lines called the staff. The higher the position of the notes on the staff, the, lower, the, the higher the sound that is represented. So you Think of it, the higher up on the staff you go, the higher the frequency. Originally, there was a great staff consisting of 11 lines. Boy, it sounds like you were almost uh, raiding a hotel. Great staff, loved it. Uh, the first seven letters of the alphabet were used as names for the sounds. The following example will show the arrangement of the various pitches with their proper letter names arranged on the great staff. So you see here that middle C, that's actually... Yeah, essentially here on on the keyboard and then I'll modulate down so that's low C so we'll call that middle C and I'm not sure if the yeah you really can't see on this keyboard that that is middle C because you think that was middle C here hold on let's there oh, we'll do that okay so oh bump it up one there we go so I'll see if I can play the notes as they appear on the keyboard and their corresponding levels. So here's the staff. So G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, F, D, E, F, and you see they repeat. So G, A, B, C, D, E, F. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G would essentially be, in fact, you can see that it goes from the lowest uh, section here on, uh, let's see, for the sake of convenience of modern notation, we use only a five-line portion of this staff. It is necessary to indicate which five-line portion of the great staff is to be used. This is done by means of clefs. Okay, so we only use half. We only use half of the great staff, as they were saying, clefs. There are three kinds of clefs, each named by the letter name of the tone upon which it is centered. So you see here the G clef. It is centered on G. And that would be on the, I don't know if I can do a notation here, but you see that this essentially, the the uh, G clef would be centered on with the letter G. So if you start at middle C, go up D, E, let's see, can you see that? Yeah. Uh, so C, D, E, F, and then G, you see that the clef symbol, the circular portion, if I zoom in on it, Wait for it. There we go. So see how it's circled around the uh, around where G would be on the clef. Um, the next one is the C clef, and it is centered on uh, the letter name upon the tone upon which it is centered. So that would be F clef is there. So where would C be? Oh, C is the center. So you, uh, so. It, it, it's the exact middle of the great staff. So where middle C occurs, you can see that that is where the C clef would would be. So from middle C on the great staff, that's the center point of the C clef. And so therefore, the next note down from there would be B, and the next note above it would be D. Then the uh, note above that would then be E, and the note below it, so two notes below the center of the staff, would be um, A. Okay, um, moving forward. The G and F clefs are the most frequently used. In writing music for piano, organ, or voices, these two clefs will be used together. So, the portion of the great staff, as you can see. The G clef is commonly called the treble clef. The F clef may be called the bass clef. To indicate the middle C for either uh, staff, an auxiliary line is used, the original middle line between the two groups of five lines. This is called a ledger line. 
So you can see these dotted portions, those are ledger lines. The C clef is used principally in orchestral writing. The position of this clef always indicates the line on which middle C occurs. It is a mistake to call this the movable clef. It may appear upon any of the first four lines of the five-line staff, but it will be seen from the following examples that the lines of the staff are moved, not the clef. So in bass baritone, Baritone is moved, you see it's been moved down one step, then tenor, alto, mezzo, soprano, soprano, treble, and super treble. So each of those, you see it, it it's just, it's trying to create ways to, uh, uh, to represent music as easily as possible so that it's, it's, it's um, relatively easy to understand what notes are trying to be indicated. As the, as above, each position of the C clef in relation to the five line staff has a name. The alto and tenor um, are the most frequently used of the C clefs in present day orchestral writing. Hence, the student must learn these thoroughly. Later, when we study transposition, we will take up all the clefs. So in a follow-up video, I will make sure to have an example of the alto and tenor clefs um, demonstrated and they said that they are uh, most frequently used in C clefs in present day orchestral writing. So I'll, I'll make sure that I have a video um, that uh, uh, shows a demonstration of that clef, uh, of that clef in action. Um, these different clefs are used so that a particular melody or line can be written without the boundaries of the five line staff, thereby making the use of a great many ledger lines unnecessary. So you try and use the whole of the staff. So you position your, your clef in such a way that you're using those five lines. So that was uh, number two, the clefs, right? Yes, number two, the clefs. Number three, notes. As has been stated above, the duration of musical sound is expressed by symbols of varying shapes, called notes. The one in use today with their proper names are listed below. So we have whole note, half note, quarter note, eighth note, sixteenth note, thirty-second note, and sixty-fourth. So that uh, so eighth through sixty-fourth, each one is, is uh, separated by the different flags. The names of the above notes are derived from their relation to a measure of common time, uh, i.e. Uh, the, uh, um, the whole uh, note lasts for a whole measure, the half note for half a measure, etc. Each of the notes in the order given is half the value of the preceding one. This will be seen from the following example. So you see from one whole note, two half notes, from two half notes, or from one whole note as well, four quarter notes. So you see it's it's simply subdividing, uh, subdividing down to the 64th, right? This is the 64th? No, this is just a 30 second example. So essentially there are there are two half notes and a whole note, four, four quarters in a whole, eight eight eighths, uh, 16 sixteenths. <laughs> 32, 30 seconds and 64, 64 ths. So there you go. It's essentially just fractionalizing the measure. These notes not only indicate the duration of musical sound, but by their placement on the staff, they indicate the pitch of the musical sound. The notes are referred to by the letter name of the line or space which they occupy. So we see here D, F, A, and, and of course this is using a treble clef. Let me see if I can zoom in just a little bit. Uh, there we go. So D, F, A, C, E, G, and uh, B, D. So the notes, you can see that the notes are listed by their names. So um, uh, two, two, let's see, one space below D would be B, and then we have D, then F, A, C, E, G, B. Uh, and then, of course, in our treble, or in our bass clef, we then have E, G, B, D, F, a, C. And that's something that you really want to focus on learning until it's second nature is the names of the clefs. So uh, I should say the positions on the clefs, what, what each space and what each line stands for. And the only way to do that is, as they said, constant drill. You constantly drill this and it, it will become second nature. As shown in the above example, the staff may be extended by use of ledger lines, as, as mentioned a little earlier, for pitches that lie outside its range, so outside the range of the clef. 
Uh, this gives us two names which we may use in referring to the notes. For example, we say a half note B or C a quarter note, etc. It will be seen that one of the two names we give to the note refers to its duration, i.e. whole note. The other name refers to the position of the note on the staff, i.e. the letter name of the note, such as A, B, or C. So we can either have pitch or we can have um, uh, pitch or duration or both. These notes, it must be understood, represent only the relative duration of the sounds. The actual duration depends upon the speed at which the music is played. It is necessary, it is necessary for the student to learn to write, uh, let's see, to write correct and legible manuscripts. Here are a few things to remember. The teacher will explain further and give the students exercises for practice. Okay. Stems go up for the notes on the lower half of the staff and are always placed to the right of the note head. Stems go down and are placed to the left for notes on the upper half of the staff. The stem for the note on the middle may go either way. So you see here that are placed to the right of the note head stems, uh, so the upper half of the staff. So the separation point on the, uh, on the treble clef would be, uh, it would be B what is essentially B, the B above middle C, that is the point at which it could go either up or down depending on the context and depending on the flow of the line. A lot of different factors there. But you see anything below the line stems up and to the right of the uh, of the note. Uh, anything, uh, anything above uh, a B above middle C um, so, uh, would be stems down on the left hand side of the note. When two parts are written on one staff, the, stem, the stems for the top part all go up. The stems for the lower part all go down, regardless of the position of the note head on the staff. So you'll see this a lot in uh, um, choral music, close form choral music, um, hymn writing, chorales, where you have multiple parts using the same staff. This is how you separate them so that uh, people can use the same music and know exactly what their parts are. When a composition begins with a partial measure, the last measure should have only as many beats as are missing from the beginning. This will be clearer when we study time and rhythm. Oh, and by the way, um, I'll, I'll just show you the parts here. So uh, pretend this is treble clef, I'll read it. So that would be the upper voice on this, on this example, and the lower voice or I, this would be the alto, essentially. So you see each of those are a different part. Uh, let's see here. So we went through composition begins with a partial measure. The last measure should have only as many beats as are missing from the beginning. Okay. When a dot is placed after a note, the duration is increased by one half of the original note value. So if you have a quarter note, as they say here, or sorry, if you have a half note with a dot, so it's called a dotted half note, then you essentially, it's the duration of half note plus a quarter note. So let's say that this is a, uh, a half note, one, two. So then a dotted half note would be one, two, three. And uh, a, d a dotted quarter, if this were a quarter, and then if I uh, did the second note, if I did it a uh, dotted quarter, See, one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. Sometimes a second dot is added. This increases the duration by one half of the value of the preceding dot. So if you have a dotted dotted note, you essentially take the value, you half it and append it, and then you half the appended note, and that's your increased value. So a dotted uh, dotted dotted quarter is a dotted, it's a quarter note with an eighth note and a sixteenth note. Another way of increasing the duration of the music is by the use of the tie. Two or more notes of the same or different value may be connected in this way. The resultant sound will be equal in duration to the sum of the various notes tied. So if you have a tied uh, half and quarter note, that is it is uh, the same as a dotted half note. Or if you have um, a half note tied to a quarter note and then a quarter note, same duration as if it were a whole note. 
Number four, rests. During the composition, uh, uh, sorry, during the course of a musical composition, it may be necessary for one or more of the parts or voices to remain silent for a period of time. These silences are indicated by signs called rests. The rests correspond exactly in duration to the notes that have a similar name. So, the, uh, the as you see, the, uh, the quarter notes, or sorry, the, um, the note durations, it's the same as the rests. So, we start at whole rest, half rest. So, two half rests is the same as a whole rest. And then, a quarter rest looks like a little... I always think of that as like a little Scottish terrier. And it, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, there's a... I don't think it was Disney, but there is a uh, um, uh, a little animation where all the notes on the on the music go, um, they become alive and animated, and they turn the quarter rest into a little dog. It's really cute. So we see here that that's a quarter rest, and then eighth rest, sixteenth rest, thirty second rest, and sixty fourth rest. So those are our rests. These are placed on the staff like this. So you see here, it doesn't, so on the treble clef, a whole rest is placed on what is essentially C, C above middle C, so the C above the, uh, an octave above. A half rest is placed just on, uh, on top of the, the B, the B staff, if you will. A quarter rest, sums, starts on G, the tail uh, starts on G, and it goes up to D. And then the eighth rest is centered on C, similar in fact, you see that the whole note, uh, that the whole rest, half rest, and eighth rest all are centered on the C above middle C. Dots are also used after rests. The duration of the rest is increased in accordance with the rule previously mentioned. So a dotted quarter note rest is a is a quarter note rest plus an eighth note rest. A dotted dotted uh, quarter note rest would be a quarter note plus an eighth note plus a sixteenth note of rest. 5. Alterations. The smallest distance from one tone to another is called a semitone, or half-step. In the alphabetical order of sounds, the notes represented are not all the same distance apart. Some of the notes are a semitone apart, while others are a whole tone, or a half-step. The whole step being equal to two half-steps. Between E and F, and between B and C, there is a half-step. Okay. So you remember how we talked about last week, we talked about um, Western music essentially being built on a 12-tone system. So this is what they're calling about the smallest distance from one tone to another is called a semitone. So essentially we're working with 12 semitones or a half step. And so on our on our uh, clef here, uh, where it corresponds to the piano, so we have C to D, whole step, D, E, whole step, E to F, half step, F to G, whole, G to A, whole, A to B, whole, B to C, half step. The extra half step between the notes uh, that are called a whole step apart may be filled in by the use of alterations, also called accidentals. These are, uh, you can see here, the first one is, un is unchanged, so that's G. Sharp, raise the note one half step. Double sharp, raises the note one whole step. Natural, cancels the previous accidental. Flat, lowers the note one half step. Uh, and then double flat, lowers the note one whole step. There we go. So, unchanged, sharp, double sharp, natural, flat, double flat. These signs are placed immediately in front of the notes which they are to affect. This gives us all of the possible notes on the scale as will be seen from the following example. So we see here on the piano, we could have C and then D, uh, uh, C sharp, but C sharp is the same as D flat, and which, <laughs> I mean, we could go crazy. It, it, it's the same also as um, B, B double sharp if need be. And then we have D, and then D sharp, D sharp is E flat, E. Now E uh, could be also F, uh, let's see, F flat. And then F could be either F natural, or it could be E sharp, or even it could be G double flat. You can see it gets really crazy uh, to think about all the, uh, all the 
possibilities. I wouldn't try. And then we have F sharp or G flat, G, G sharp or A flat, A, A sharp or B flat, B or C flat. There we go. The student should also note from the above diagram that many of the sounds may be written in two ways. Uh, as you see, that's what we were just talking about. When we have two different notes that have the same sound as in the above example, their relationship is said to be enharmonic. Enharmonic, okay? So for instance, this note here, this is the, it could be enharmonically written as either D sharp or E flat. The natural sign is used to cancel a sharp, double sharp, flat, or double flat that has previously been used to raise or lower a note. The double sharp and the double flat respectively raise and lower the note one whole step. Hence, it is often more practical to write this sound by using the next higher or the next lower note in the scale. For this reason, the double sharp and double flat will occur less frequently than the sharp, flat, or natural. So you see, for instance, A is the same as G double sharp. A is also the same as B double flat. Uh, the reason why uh, I'm not sure I'm not sure if they're going to mention it here, but the reason why we have double sharp and double flat is primarily um, a theoretical um, um, reason in that when you're dealing with harmonies and you want notes to lead to each other or you're working with them in relationship to each other, very often you're thinking in terms of leading tones. You're leading from one note to the next. Well, the direction will be dependent or will will um. Uh, will change what type of notation you use. So that's just a little aside. Uh, any accidental effects, uh, uh, any accidental effects all the notes of the same letter names throughout an entire measure, unless it is contradicted by another accidental. The succeeding measures are not affected, but when the note of the same letter name occurs in its natural form in a measure immediately following its unaltered form, it is best to clarify this return by the use of the natural sign. So in the example they give us, so you see we, we um, uh, um, flatted the B and the very next time we have a B, if we want to have it as B natural, we indicate that, as they say, clarify. And there we go. If an accidental is to apply to the same note, but at a different octave, it is best to indicate this by the use of another accidental. That way, when someone's playing along, they don't um, c completely overlook the, uh, the, the, the movement. So D, A, Up, bum, bum, bum. Okay, there we go. So you see here that F, both, it, as they say, uh, it's the same note, but a different octave. It's best to indicate this by the use of another ad accidental. Number six, time signatures. In any melody, certain notes will be relatively more important than others. These more important notes seem to have more weight or accent than do the notes of less importance. This accent generally occurs at some interval. This grouping of sounds by means of accent produces one of the most important elements in music, that of time. The student must not confuse this with the word tempo, which has to do with the rate of speed at which a, music, a piece of music is performed. The teacher will make this distinction clear. I guess I'm supposed to make that clear. Okay, so this idea is that time, time has to do with the weight of something. It has to do with where we're putting our emphasis on the notes. Tempo has to do with the execution it's the execution of that um, of that time. So we could execute a time at a relatively fast tempo, or we could execute a time at a relatively slow tempo. You see that that so tempo has to do with execution. Time has to do with the weight or where we're putting our emphasis. Uh, we indicate this recurring accent in the music by placing a perpendicular line on a staff in front 
of the accented note. These lines are called bar lines, and the space between two successive lines is called a measure. So the, as you see this top portion right here, if you look all the way to the right hand side after the dotted quarter note, oh, sorry, the dotted half note, that is our bar line. And then we have on the second example below, not only do we have a bar line, we have this perpendicular line on the staff, but we also have these lines which are separating out uh, different portions. Those are called measures, measure lines. At the conclusion of a composition or an important section of a composition, we place a double bar. So you see a, a, a relatively thick width bar on the right hand side, followed by a thinner width bar on the left. These accents occur not only at, so these accents of time uh, occur not only at regular intervals, but also at greater or smaller intervals of time. This produces, this produces measures of various lengths of various lengths. Contained in each measure will be the accented note followed by the notes of lesser importance lasting up to the time that another strong accent occurs. So the strong accent always occurs at the beginning of a measure line. Okay. In fact, they're probably going to say that. Um, the These patterns, yes, these patterns of strong and weak accents have a regular pulsation for a background. We call these pulsations beats. When we tap our feet or march to a piece of music, we are expressing this background of beats. So if I play um, on, the, uh, on the piano, so you see, I'm subdividing, but my strength That's my strong bum, bum, bum. So you see my strong note, ding, dun, dum, bum, 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 bum. So if you were to pat your feet or march, dum, bum, bum, dum, strong, weak. Weak, strong, weak, 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 strong, weak, weak, weak. So you see, that's time. That's the idea of time. The uh, the most common patterns produced, depending upon the recurrence of the strong accent, contain two, three, or four beats. This is called duple, triple, or quadruple time, according to the number of beats each group contains. These different times are written like this: duple, in which each measure is divided by two beats, as either written, as you see on the left hand side two half notes or two quarter notes or two eighth notes and they are so like this first one one two one two one two and the second one is also one two one two one two one two and the last one one two one two now notice i am per, i am playing them all at the same uh at the same tempo but they are they have a different character as far as time is concerned right so here we're already seeing a difference between tempo and time triple in which and so okay so moving forward after duple we then have triple triple in which each measure is equally divided by three beats by three beats okay so one two three one two three one two three one two three, one, two, three. Now notice if I treat these all as if they were um, uh, uh, obeying the uh, half note tempo, then it would be one, two, three, one, two, three, bum. Da da dun, da da dun. See, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So that's where your beats are occurring, three beats in a measure. Quadruple is our final one in which each measure is divided uh, is equally divided by four beats so one two three four and then measure break one two three four measure break okay quadruple time is actually an extension of duple time except that the accent on the third beat is not sorry i got 
I had to take a, a phone call. Okay, various other groupings are possible, such as, okay, so we were talking about quadruple time is actually an extension of duple time, except that the accent on the third beat is not quite as strong as the accent on the first beat. So we go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, three, four. So looking at our example, one, two, three, four, one, one, two, three, four. So we're not thumping that third beat, so to speak, on our duple time. It's one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And then on our on our quadruple, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So your emphasis, ah, it really depends on the execution, but um, it could be like half half the emphasis of your downbeat, so to speak. It, so like half the accent. Various other groupings are possible, such as five, six, or seven beats to a measure, but these actually will be combinations of the above three patterns. So um, they're, let's see here, uh, let's see, um, five, so five beats, it could be either two beats and then three beats. So one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. Or it could be uh, um, three and two. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. Um, seven would be four and three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Or it could be three and four. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And so you see, you have to fill out a particular amount of time. Your accent would be on your downbeat, but then you would divide it um, as as you need it in the music. Um, let's see, five, uh, no, not five, but seven could even be two, three, two, if you want it. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, or and that's pretty much it, because then if you do two, two, three, you're now essentially back at four and three. So you see, you can further divide. You can even have nine, five, six, or nine. Uh, the same kind of time is generally used throughout a piece of music uh, or section of music. And in order to make this clear to the performer, we indicate the time of the beginning of the composition by means of a time signature. The time signature consists of two figures placed one above the, the other like this three, four. They are written on the staff immediately after the clef sign. So see here this in this little example, we have our treble clef followed by our time signature, which is three, four. Now let's explain what that means. The upper figure indicates the number of divisions or beats in a measure. The lower figure indicates the kind of note to be used for each beat. Thus, in two, four time, there will be two beats in each measure a quarter note to each beat. In 3-8 time, there will be three beats to the measure, each represented by an eighth note. So once again, this is just our way of separating out the time, what's getting the emphasis, what's getting the accent. The lower figure will always be one of these, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, a figure which expresses the name of a kind of note, such as a quarter note, four, half note, two, etc. So you think of these as as being various subdivisions of one, right? One divided by uh, one in half is two. Two halved, if you will, is four. Um, four halved is eight. Eight uh, halved is 16. And you can see as you go further and further. Let's see. The upper figure may be any number, but usually this is not greater than 12. Okay, so any number can maybe may be any number, but usually this is not greater than 12. When each beat of a measure is divisible by two, i.e. when the beat can be expressed by two notes of the same smaller note value, the time is called simple time. Thus, we have simple duple time, simple triple time, and simple quadruple time. So as they said, when the beat can be represented by two notes of the next smaller note value. So we have two, two, uh, which is our whole note. So our subdivision is two and it is. So that would be our simple duple time Two four time. Also simple duple time. This is where we have two beats in the measure and they're receiving the quarter notes. The quarter note is receiving as as they say, what is that? Um, 
Yes, the lower figure indicates the kind of note to be used for each beat. So number of divisions or beats and kind of note. So once again, in 2-4, uh, the number of beats, the number of divisions is 2. The kind of beat that is receiving that division is 4. 2-8, it would be number of beats in the measure, 2. The note that's receiving that beat, 8. A uh, simple triple time is... 3, 2. So this is three notes in the measure, so a, a division of three, and the half note is getting the beat. 3, 4. Once again, three divisions in the measure, the quarter note is getting the beat. Finally, 3 eighths is there are three notes in the measure, and the eighth note is getting the beat. Simple quadruple time. So you see now we're in four. There are four uh, sub, uh, there are four divisions. The half note gets the beat. The second one down, quarter note gets the beat, St still a quadruple time. And then finally, the eighth note gets the beat, sorry. Uh, so so those are our simple quadruple time. So we simple duple time, simple triple time, and simple quadruple time. However, sometimes the music requires that each beat be divisible by three, i.e. a triplet of the notes next smaller in value. So we have here in two, four time, this would be one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So you see here that we are getting our, that, that our, our beat is two, this is two, four time. So our accent is on one, it, it, it's on the first of the measure, but it's divided into two, right? So one, two, one, two, one, two, one, Two. So you can see our time is divided that way. And then below, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So if I were to play this, I'm, I'm having, I have a very small keyboard here, so I can't really uh, um, play them. There we go. Do you see that? So. Um, um, um. So I've got to play it. And there we go. So you see division by three, trying to fit into two. To avoid marking triplets throughout a composition, a new time signature is employed. Thus, the preceding example should be written as follows. So these are the exact same, whether it's in two, four, six, eight. And there we go. So that would be 6-8. What this is saying, this signature means that 6 eighth notes of a whole note are found in each measure. They will be divided into two groups of three. Instead of having two quarter notes in each measure, we now have two dotted quarter notes. So that, uh, as you see, so, so now the note that is taking the beat, so to speak, is a dotted quarter, a, a dotted quarter note. When the beats of a measure are dotted, the time is called compound time. So we have compound duple time, compound triple time, and compound quadruple time. Uh, the time signature being as follows. So how do you tell the difference between simple and compound? Simple has no dotted, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the beat is not dotted. Compound, it is dotted, okay? So whatever is receiving the beat if it has to have a dot with it, we know that it's compound time. So 6-4 time, for instance, we see that our, our basic beats, our, our half note, is, uh, is dotted. Um, and so therefore, we know we're going to have to have three quarter notes. And in fact, you see here, there are six divisions in the, in the measure. And, that, and the note that's receiving that division is the quarter note, 6-4. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. So if I were to play that... There we go. And then 6-8 time. Once again, six divisions in the measure. And the and the eighth note is getting the is getting the beat. So see they sound the exact same, uh, but you'll use one differently. Um, um, or you'll use them in different cases. And 6-16 time. So once again. There we go. So you see here, six divisions of so this is 
compound duple time. Six divisions of of the uh, of the key uh, of the measure. I'm sorry, and then the division is either going to be quarter, eighth, or sixteen. Compound triple time. This is there are going to be nine di nine um, divisions, so to speak, and uh, uh, then of course we have our quarter, our eighth, sixteenth notes uh, corresponding with that. So with this one, notice. You have to, in order to tell what note is going to receive the dot, you you look at your at your um, the lower note of your time signature. In this case, nine four. You you look at the four and you jump up one. So from four you go to two, right? So you you multiply by two essentially, and then that note, whatever is the two in this case, it's a half note, is going to receive the dot. So that's how you can uh, tell which one would receive the dot. So for eighth note, nine eight time, we know there are going to be nine notes in in the measure, and the note that's receiving the uh, the the beat is the eighth note. So therefore, take eight, multiply, and you actually divide it by. Oh yeah, you do divide it by two. You don't multiply it by two. You divide it by two, and then that's the note that is receiving the dot. So eight divided by two, four four. So it's the quarter note, and so it's a dotted quarter. Sixteen half it, eighth, and so it's a dotted eighth note. Once again, nine notes, so nine sixteenth notes, but they're divided into three. Uh, twelve, and so this is our compound quadruple time, so twelve four, twelve eight, and twelve sixteen. It's important to observe that the divisions or beats of any measure may be expressed by their equivalent in notes of longer or shorter duration, or by their equivalent in notes and rests. Okay, so every single measure has to have um, uh, the number, the correct number of durations. Let's see, the the correct number of divisions. Whether those divisions are made up of actual pitches that are played or rests doesn't matter. You have to have um, that that many divisions. So in the example here, when we have um, four four time, we know that we are in simple quadruple time. Correct. The uh, quarter note is receiving the beat, and so therefore we have to have some representation, some makeup of of notes and rests in there to meet our requirement of four beats in the measure. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, off. And then uh, 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 the next example: one, two, three, one, one, two, and three, and three, and. Notice I'm, if you. If you do divisions, you do and. So one, two, three, four, one, two, and one, two, and three, and four. There we go. All right, and our final section, artificial division of notes. In discussing note values in a previous paragraph, we gave these divisions of a whole note, right? Whole note can be divided by two, we get a quarter note. And then a quarter note divided by two, eighth note, divided 16th, 30. 32nd, 64th. The above figures, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and 64, represent the natural divisions of a note. However, it is possible to divide a note into other fractional parts, such as 1, uh, one third, 1 fifth, 1 sixth, etc. These other figures, such as 3, 5, 6, 7, 9, etc., represent the artificial divisions of a note. So if it's not, if it's not, um, uh, an even number, essentially, then it's going to be an artificial division. Artificial divisions of plane units. For these artificial divisions, we use the regular notes, uh, the regular note values. Choose the kind of note for the artificial division that represents the nearest natural division. If the artificial number is is equidistant from two of the natural division numbers, we use the note value represented by the smaller number. Then place the number of the artificial division above the note group. Okay, that's that's pretty wordy. So let's actually show an example. We want to divide a quarter note into five equal parts. The natural division, the nearest natural division is four. Okay, uh, and so think about it, it's either going to be between 4 and what's the next one up? It's going to be 8, right? So either 4 or 8, so the nearest natural division is 4. So therefore, 
we go down to the, uh, we take a quarter note divided by four. That gives us four sixteenth notes. Four divided by four is 16. Right. That's not really the case, but you, you take your note and then you divide it into four. So it's 16th notes. You then write five sixteenth notes with the number five above. So you simply take your nearest division, tack on the extra value to get your artificial division, and then have a, uh, a slur underneath, I believe that would be called, a slur, and then five, and, that's, and that is your artificial division. To, rep, to divide a half note into six equal parts, we would use six eighth notes with the figure six above or below them because six is equidistant between four and eight. Four is the smaller of the two numbers, so we use eighth notes, which represent the natural division of a half note divided by four. Notice equidistant, go with the smaller of the values. So eight, uh, a half note divided by four is four eighth notes. You then take your, and, and then you see here that if you have your half note divided by eight, it's sixteenth notes, it's eight sixteenth notes. So go with your smaller value, which is gonna be the half note. You then tack on two more and you get your uh, half note divided by six into your six eighth notes, okay? Artificial division of dotted of dotted units. For artificial division of dotted notes in compound time, we mentally disregard the, the dot and divide the unit according to the above procedure. Okay, so you you essentially are working only in simple time. When you're looking at artificial division, you jump down to the uh, to the simple time uh, uh, um, values. After the kind of note has been determined, we add a dot or as many dots as follow the original note to each note in the final example, uh, in the final group. To divide a dotted whole note into five equal parts, we would disregard the dot and divide the whole note into five quarter notes. Remember, go to the nearest uh, nearest natural division. So um, a, a whole note divided by four is four quarter notes tack one on, now you have artificial division of five. Then add a dot to each of the quarter notes in the final group. So it's actually pretty simple. All you have to do, jump down to simple time. So if you're in compound time and you're trying to do artificial division, jump down to simple time, turn it into, turn it, turn the dotted whole note into um, uh, a regular whole note, figure out what the artificial division is, and then simply add a dot and now you have your compound time that has been converted into an artificial, you have your artificial division of compound time. To divide a double dotted half note into nine equal parts, we would mentally suppress the two dots and divide the half note in the usual way. There we go, okay? So notice actually what's going on is you're simply uh, chopping off whatever that, uh, that, whether it's a dotted or a double dotted, and uh, you perform your division, and then you add your dot at the end. When notes are grouped together, they are given the following names. So a group of two equal notes or equivalent is called a duplet or duolet. Three is called a triplet. Four is a quadruplet. Five quintuplet or quintilet, six sextuplet and double triplet or sextilet, uh, seven is a septuplet or septilet, eight octuplet or octolet, nine nonuplet or nonalet, and ten is a dextuplet or dextilet. Man, I would love to know if any of those actually exist in real life, because that's funny. There is a difference between a sextuplet and a double triplet. The sextuplet is derived from a triplet, each note divided by two. A double triplet is derived from a duolet, each note uh, divided by three. So the sextuplet is derived from a triplet, each note divided by two. A double triplet is derived from a duolet, each note divided by three. So you see each one is where it's getting its emphasis. So on, on our left-hand example, a sextuplet, your your beat would be, so one, two, dum, bum, 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 dum, bum, 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 bum. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, and two, and three, and. On the right-hand side, it's one, 
and two and dun 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 bum bum bum. So it's it's really where you're putting your emphasis. So that's the difference between a sextuplet and a double triplet. And that's where we're going to stop for today. So that was our sections seven through or one through seven. So what exactly did we cover? We covered, let's go back to our heading. We covered staffs, what staffs are, our grand staff, our, um, uh, and how, how all of music is some variation of the grand staff. Our clefs are how we take that grand staff and divide it so that we don't have to use a whole lot of ledger lines in writing music. Uh, three is our notes. So these include not only our pitches, but also our note values. So the um, how much time we're giving. Uh, and then five, let's see, four were rests. So this is where you take your your time and you figure out what what notes or what periods of time are you not playing for. Those are your rests. And remember, rests and notes share the same um, uh, time divisions, if you will. Whole note, uh, whole note, uh, half note, quarter note, uh, 18th, 16th, 8th, 16th, 16th, 64th, uh, um, uh, 32nd, 64th, and then our alterations is where we take our normal names, in this case, like uh, as we see down here, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then we can either sharp it or flat it. Sharp is to increase it by a half tone. Flat is to decrease it by half tone. Double sharp is to increase it a whole step. Uh, double flat is to decrease it by a whole step. And then of course we have our natural, which is to take your previous, uh, whatever the previous accidental was, and you simply return it back to the note name. Um, then we have time signatures, and remember we talked about simple time, so we could have simple duple, simple uh, triple, simple quadruple, or we could have compound time. And the difference between compound and uh, and simple time is that compound has to have some uh, some uh, sort of dotted note involved. It's a division of three, if you will. And then finally, our artificial division of notes. This is where you take your regular notes and or your your um, your regular divisions and you are are messing with it in some way to tack on extra um, extra values. And that's it. So thank you very much for watching. Um, this has been day 18 of, of make a uh, make a daily video. Um, so uh, join me next week uh, for another a music video in which we hope to cover uh, sections 8 through 14, key signatures, dynamic indications, tempo indications, musical abbreviations, names of octaves, names of musical instruments and voices, and melodic embellishments. So thank you very much for watching, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.